everyone, it's Gordon Einstein, your Dubai resident crypto and blockchain attorney, uh, continuing with my avocation, my hobby, uh, conducting semi-impromptu interviews with really interesting people in technology and Web3 and blockchain and crypto. Uh, today, I, it's actually kind of a different story. It's someone who I am just getting to know, uh, came across my awareness by coincidence, but his his bio and following on LinkedIn were so impressive. I, I kind of dug in a little bit and he was, you know, you'll be able to tell he's a, he's a very busy, successful man, but it was kind enough to spare some time for this talk. So Alvin Fu, uh, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you taking the time and being responsive to someone you, who you hadn't met yet. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank, thanks for, for inviting me on your show. Well, certainly we don't know each other, but we're very thankful because there's a thing called LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, it has definitely connected everybody. Yes. And when people meet, whether that's going to be online, offline, you know, magic happens, right? Magic like this just happened, right? And we get connected, you know, over thousands and thousands of miles and uh, and people that, that we don't even know, right? Uh, but I'm sure uh, we are we all very blessed. Uh, we live in a world where it's so super connected. It's great. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you're, I, mean, you're, I see you're an avid user or... I don't even know if that's right. We'll call right and call you of LinkedIn. And I, I love social media because people, people, you know, people have a negative view of it sometimes. I, I don't think it's negative. I think I've been able to create and maintain relationships over time and space that I never would have otherwise. And it's it's funny. I have friends now where I literally can't remember if I ever actually met them in person. And I can't remember <laughs> where we first met. It's like, you know, it, it blends so seamlessly. And there's some people where I worked with them for years over Zoom or chat, and I meet them in person. And we, like an hour into it, we're like, have we ever actually met before? Like met, met? We're like, wow, it's the first time. So it's kind of cool. So I, 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 would, I, I always, I, the way I structure these, I'm kind of disgusted before we start recording, is we want to focus on your main uh, focus, if you like, for the majority of the show, which as I understand it is Web3 and blockchain. You're very involved in incubating your startups. But you're you're such a fascinating person with your huge LinkedIn bio. I want to get some background on you first, if you don't mind. So I always like to start. I always like to start from the beginning. Where, where were you, where were you born? Where where are you from? <laughs> uh, I'm actually a Malaysian. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in Malaysia, in KL to be more specific. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up here. I I went to school here in Malaysia. I did my law degree in London, uh, in England. Oh. I graduated as a, as, a, as a lawyer by profession. So, so I actually started off my career uh, as, a, as a lawyer. Uh, but it was a very short thing that uh, after tasting what, you know, what the legal profession is all about, I decided that I want to get into something else. Uh, and, and I've always wanted to be in business. I never knew why specifically, but I'm always... You know, I want to be a, my own boss, you know, and, and even even when I was a kid, I want to be my own boss. Right. So but I but no clue whatsoever what to do, no clue whatsoever what my, my direction would be. But somehow in my mind, I just to do something on my own. So I, I actually worked for. Yeah. So I actually worked for people initially. Then I got into startup very early. I obviously. Let me just pick it a little bit and then we'll catch up. There you are in Kuala Lumpur, and you end up at law school in the UK. How, right. did, how did that happen? And what happened before law school? Just, just kind of give me a little bit more. Little oh, bit more okay. okay. So I, I, I did my, well, in Malaysia, Malaysia, very similar to England. We did, you know, elementary and then secondary school and college. And so okay. so it, I did all that in Malaysia, in KL, right? And uh, I for my undergrad, right, I actually went to London. And that's where I completed my undergrad and, and ended up with a law degree. That's how it all happens. But the first uh, formative years of, of like 13 years was spent in Malaysia. And then subsequently, uh, I, I you know, took the opportunity to, uh, to you know, complete my law degree in, in, in London. And, so and that's, then, that's what did you study in college? What, what was your focus before university uh, or before law school? I well, I did I did law all the way from college, so so from got college it, got to it. university, okay. yeah, I completed my entire yeah uh, law course, and then ended up with a law degree, and then I came out, and then I started working for for a law firm, and that's how I started my career. My initial one of my initial career was to work in the, as a legal counsel in a in, in a legal department in the conglomerate in, in England. 
Interesting. Okay, so you, you, you had enough of that. You would always been interested in business. You kind of bravely, I, I, I wonder what your parents said about it. After all that legal study, you know, I went through this a little bit. All, after all that legal study, you decide not to be a lawyer. Oh, right, wow. right. <laughs> So I so I actually so I so I actually came back to Malaysia after that, and I actually started a, a very early. This was back in the nineteen ninety. I reckon it was nineteen ninety three, ninety four when I first started my startup. Yeah. It wasn't now the, the 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 concept of startup don't exist then, mm -hmm. don't exist in in this part of the world. It wasn't called a startup. It was just purely doing your own business, becoming your own boss, or you want to call them entrepreneurial, right? So I started my own own business. Mm -hmm. uh, the first business I started was in, into trading, you know, trading, 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 uh, well, IP rights in those days, you know, and uh, really? of course it wasn't very successful. So, so my, my first attempt, uh, first attempt at doing business in 93, 94 didn't do very well. Uh, in fact, I failed. <laughs> uh, with, 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 with most people, you know, doing it for, for the first time, the first attempt, usually don't, you, usually you don't make it, right? And, and it's right. good because... Uh, the not making it part, the failure and all that, that's great learning. And of course, you know, once you you don't make it in your first attempt, you you basically fail and then you, you're broke again, right? So you, once, you're, once you don't have enough money, then you go back and work for someone else. So I went back to, to work again and I work in an advertising company, a traditional advertising. In those days, there, there's, there isn't a thing called digital advertising yet. In those right. days, it was TV advertising, radio advertising, magazine advertising. So it was called... Traditional advertising by today's standard. So this is this sounds like it's mid nineties. Would you say? This was like in nineteen ninety four. Okay, yeah, nineteen ninety four. So I worked for someone, in, and I and I actually worked for less than a year before I even. So I actually worked for this company for a year, an advertising company, and Im immediately uh, after that, I started my own advertising company. So okay. I learned the trade, and I thought I could do it right. <laughs> So that was my second attempt. Uh, I, I did fairly well when I started the advertising company. I actually grew the company from like, you know, uh, from zero revenue uh, to, to about 30 people within a year. That's amazing. Right. Rapid growth. And, uh, and it was then in 95, what changed my life was really uh, two things. One, the advent of internet. Mm. So there was, so this was like in 1996 where, I was introduced to internet. Like, you know, in the, in the US, you have America Online, right? AOL. Yeah. And Malaysia, we have the local version called MOL, Malaysia Online. <laughs> so I just, <laughs> it's, a, of, it's of the course, same thing. Actually, you, yeah. yeah, I mean, you subscribe to, to the service, they give you a CD-ROM, and then they give you a, a 9.6 modem. I'm sure you've been there, right? Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I was about to make a joke. You know, did you have the KOL CD-ROMs? But it, it, it sounds, uh, MOL. You know, did you have the MOL uh, CD-ROMs? But it sounds like you actually did, which is pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, it, it was basic. It was it was for the purpose of installing, <laughs> installing the startup kit on your on your on your PC. Then, sure. Uh, so that was my that was my first view of the internet. So that was my first experience, and I also came at, at the same time. There was a book that I read that also. Completely game change uh, uh, my thinking towards the uh, the future of uh, of of internet technology and this book called The Road Ahead by Bill Gates. Yep, yep, yep. yep. I'm not sure whether um, you may have seen it before, but it was a. Uh, I I, was I read a, it. I know exactly what you're talking about, and it, and it was actually somewhat impactful when it came out, and I think it was his whole vision of the internet and, and connectivity. Yeah, absolutely wow. right, absolutely. So it gave me the, the 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 idea of the world ahead that's going to be you know broadband, uh, the communication superhighway, and and all the all, all the possibility that that could could be transformed right from from a thing called internet. Well, of course, at that time when I was reading the book, right, we were on the narrow band, <laughs> very narrow. It was nine point six k, mm. but but because of having an, a narrow band that gave me insight. To what's possible, I decided even when I was running an advertising company that I need to get into this business because before, before the advent of internet, before anything else, right? All I knew, my computer was like an advanced typewriter. Yes. <laughs> so it was an advanced typewriter. It was it was purely for the sake of uh, doing 
my no, Microsoft. I, I, I say that I said this right problem. before the internet. It was all word processing. And, yeah, and games. absolutely right. Yeah. So 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 that gave me uh, a, a great opportunity for me to tap, and I say I, I need to get into this business, and I, and I have no clue. But that book that I read really changed my mind, and I and and I got glued, you know, to to the internet. I spent like. Like I spend like, you know, like maybe on the average between six to eight hours just browsing in internet, even though it was on a narrow band, but, mm -hmm. but because there was no comparison. So a narrow band to me at that time was a, was a broad band already. Sure. <laughs> and, 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 and I actually bumped, stumbled onto something, an opportunity that I actually created out of nothing was, it was then called internet telephony. Yep. So today, by today's standard, it's called voice over IP. Uh, and 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 obviously there are a lot of this uh, end client, you know, client side uh, apps that's that that like you know like Skype, WhatsApp that cannot. Whatever that we are doing right now, is what I envisioned in 1996, right? To take the voice traffic over a broadband network. Yes. So I was so I I was one of the probably one of the earliest like probably there were only like five providers or probably five in the entire world or probably first. I was definitely first in Malaysia, first probably in Southeast Asia to do this. Yeah, this was like really early stage. And at the time, during that era, there was only like two companies who has got their technology. One is an Israel com Israeli company called, and both of them were also from Israel. Mm -hmm. One is called Vocatech, and the other one is from Claren. Very early days. Now, I, I, I got to ask, because I, I, re I remember this era. Did you run it into any sort of national monopoly issue or telephony monopoly okay. issue legally where you <laughs> now the 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 voice traffic business for any country at that time except for the united states uh that is they're fully deregulated right most countries is a regulated business where it's entirely controlled and dominated by the government yes. uh, uh government linked companies like malaysia would be telecom malaysia uh, and and but I looked through the entire statutory, right? The entire law, and when I was looking at the telecommunication law that was drafted years back, there was no internet in there. There was no voice that you can that there's nothing to stop you to to offer a service to take a voice traffic over a private intranet or even an internet. Yes. So so it was a gray area. <laughs> it was a gray area. So. And I was in uh, a uh, region, and the, 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 the region that, that was, in terms of deregulation, the quickest in deregulation was Hong Kong mm -hmm. and Singapore. And even they, the, the, the entire deregulation took place two years after I started my business. So, so I was in, a, in an area where, again, it was a gray area. It, was, it wasn't an area that would be, I don't think the local regulator would be happy but there was no law that I, I I broke no law, right? So so effectively, I was just offering a if you want to call it in a, in the most technical term, it was a data service, right? Yeah, it was it, like it, as it, if it, I was it sending just an email. That the, in, it just happened that inside the packets so was voice traffic, but it, it who cares? You know, like. exactly, exactly. So so it was a in during those era and and like ninety nine point nine nine percent nobody even heard of voice telephone. So but there was there was there was bits and pieces of software out there. There was there was this this one software that I, that I was playing playing with that allows me to do this voice telephone service that gave me this, you know, inspired me, right? So I was playing, but it was it was a very poor service at that time. And like one, it was real time, but there was so much delay in that call. It was like if I had to say hello, it takes like five seconds okay. to reach the other end. Right, and because he was over a night of his tape, compressed voice, and so forth, right? So, so I came up with an idea. Said, if I can reduce the delay, I could possibly offer a very good service. Mm -hmm. And and to cut the story short, right? I actually built a, a business out of uh, out of voice voice. Uh, I want to call it internet internet call service. Uh, so what I did was I knew uh, in an, in the US you could buy local long distance at you know wholesale. So mm -hmm. what I did was I put a so I bought it an, an IPLC, which is an a private circuit, internet oh, wait, private wait, circuit. Wait, did, did, did you route KL voice traffic through the US and back? Correct. So I put no I way. Put, I mean, I in, did a lot of research. 90s? So, 
So I did a lot of research. So I know there is like all this backbone in on the, on the 60 Hudson Street in uh, in New York yep. and also in LA. So I put I put all the all the calls right uh, from Malaysia through an IPLC. Now initially I was using a a, a service called UUNet. So at that time there was all this managed data service. Uh, so you you can imagine I learned all this from the internet. I so nobody was teaching me. So I creamed. RJ forty five cable tested it on 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 the on a uh, uh you know internet environment and then a managed data service environment and then and I knew that the only way to to offer a good service is to put is is to have an IPLC and IPLC in those days a T one was super costly it I was remember. like I think it was like I if I can record it rightly it was like forty five thousand or forty thousand years per month. Something like that. That sounds a little high, but you know, I just want to remind the audience: we're talking about one point five megabits. That's it for a T one. Exactly. Which is exactly like and nothing. <laughs> yeah, and because we compress it, you know, so we have got a, a, a different kind of codec. But but so we did we did like some 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 it went to as slow as 20, uh, 20 times compression. So again, depending on how much we want to maintain the quality, mm -hmm. and we want to put as much core as we can to, into that IPLC. Sure. Uh, and so, and I started buying long distance from the U.S. and I connect. And in in those days, I could afford to pay this because the local long dis the, the long distance call in Malaysia was like really expensive. Sure, it was like I think in those days to make a call to the U.S. was like one fifty dollars, right? And I could mm -hmm. buy and I could buy local long distance right and land on sixty yards in the street like for five cents or four cents. Now, so you can imagine, right? Let me here, ask you: Was there was there landline phone numbers associated with your service or was it like an app to app call or how did, how did you do it? No, 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 no. It was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a number that you need to call in. So th okay. there is, there is a toll free number that you call in and then we reroute all those traffic. I remember that. Okay, sure. Yes. Got it. <laughs> those days apps, apps and software are not popular yet. This was like in 1997, 98. No, but I, this was I, I remember services like what you're talking about. And it's neat. It's neat to talk to someone who actually did it. Okay, so right. I mean, going. You can think of it as a AT AT and T calling car. Yes. Right. It's the same thing like AT and T calling card, except that my calling card, you know, the traffic is being routed to the data network. So that's it. Perfect. So 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 we were pumping traffic, and then I start to offer this service not just in in KL, all over all over Southeast Asia. Hong Kong, Singapore. I work with partners. I set up operations all over Asia. So, so I grew that into a very sizable concern. Yeah, I think we had, at at the peak we had like five hundred people, six hundred people company. Nice. So, so I ran that business from nineteen ninety seven, ninety eight, all the way to uh, twenty oh six. And That's I exited that. Time. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, so it was it was the calling card business. It was the corporate communication services that we were offering. Mm -hmm. I even now I'm I'm one of the very early, but you know you know what Elon Musk is doing in Star in Starlink, right? I did that in 2002. Okay. Right, using satellite yeah. broadband. But in those days, the reason why I came out with this uh, offering was because there there's a lot of remote location around Asia, Southeast Asia, like you know that could be hospital, that could be. Uh, that could be any company that has got, you know, uh, they are located all over remotely. So we you, you, you got the whole Indonesian archipelago. I don't know if you're serving there from right. Malaysia, but it could be. Right, right. So, so, so we were offering this uh, service. So, so I that that was that gave rise to the idea of offering satellite broadband in 2002. You were very early. Yeah. So I I'm one of the at, at the time like was so early. I'm I'm probably one of the, but but. I'm not offering the service over a KU band. I mean, the, the band that uh, Starling is using is very different because yes. this, this was an old technology. So it was over C band. And now this was like 1.8 meter, huge by yes. any standard. And the reason why we are using a, 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 a C band as opposed to a KU band is because the C band, regardless of rain or shine, you still get a line of sight. So you can punch through everything, even though it, it, even if there's a storm, right? But a okay. KU band, the small, the small dish, right? It, it, it's it, it won't work. And the way satellite works is that you know, it, depending on where your satellite is located, whether it's on a Leo Joe and whatever you, 
So the C band satellite sits at the furthest part of of, of the um, of the air time Earth. So so therefore a C band wall wall is actually the only problem is that installation is problematic because you need quite a big space to get to 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 access it, uh, the line of sight. So I installation is difficult. Yeah, but so we only do companies. We don't do end users. So it's mainly just for for enterprise. Uh, it's an enterprise solution. So we were one. We probably the largest, and I think maybe 50, 60 percent market share. But again, the the total number of users are not not massive because again, we are not end user. Not what Starlink. It, it, it doesn't need to be massive. You're, 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 this is an enterprise solution, yes. Enterprise solution. Okay. So there's the there's the dish, there's a decoder, and then yeah. there's a router, and then it connects to 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 all the machines. Super. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm, I'm I, so curious how this ends up with Web three and crypto and blockchain, but I, I guess it's related because it's communications and network. So uh, I I think I'm, the way I look at technology is that I I look I look a bit. I look far into into the business and see where where we are we going from here. Uh, so if I if I if I were to look back at the book and inspired by the book, right, is to look very far. I think Bill Gates looked very very far down the road, right. And and when I look at any any attempt to do any business, I, there must be at least a ten years to fifteen years horizon. Okay. So so right, and so that's the reason why I went to China in in. So I I've been going in and out of China since twenty. 2002. Okay. And it was in 2006 that I decided that uh, I want to move there and, and, and settle in, in China for a long term. And simply because when I was looking at what I was trying to do, right, is that China has got the largest mobile users. And that would also be the largest mobile internet users in the world. Yes. So, so if you want to do anything around mobile internet, right, I mean, China has to be the best best location, right? Geography-wise, in terms of size, dynamics, and so forth. So, and, and just out of curiosity, I, I know you said you're from Malaysia, but I, I believe, are, are you Chinese speaking? I, I am I am Chinese speaking. Okay, interesting. Wow, and Cantonese or Mandarin or both? I can speak like uh, 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 four dialects and Mandarin. My man. Okay, and, <laughs> and I, I guess you must speak Malay also. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I went to a Malay school, so I speak the local language. This is this is impressive. So you, you're you're able to operate in many environments. I mean, obviously, fluent English, fluent Malay, lots of Chinese, and the, you know, there's, I'm aware the dialects are extremely diff different from each other. But that's that's great. Okay, so so what what happened with your satellite company, or what was what was how did that end up, or what was the next phase? So so in twenty in twenty in twenty o four, we exited to our competitor. Uh, one of our computer, computer, a much larger competitor. Uh, we wanted to go public. Uh, I actually missed, I actually missed the dot com uh, 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 run. Uh, mm -hmm. want, I want, I want to take, you know, take my company public. I just missed that, missed that dot com run. Uh, and so, so the last, the last option was to then uh, to go public IPO in Malaysia, and which we did. Yes. Uh, but. Just before before going public, right? We 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 exited the business to a a local competitor back in twenty o four, and then there was an turnout for two years, and then I I completely exited the company twenty o six, and then took my next dive and and I moved to China. I mean, moving yeah. to China was was in in some way accidental because never thought about it in my entire life that I want to go and work uh, in China, but it it was just accidental. The opportunity came, and again. You know, I saw the market. You know, uh, a huge. You know, the scale is dynamic. You know, and everything was going rapidly back in twenty oh six. So I decided to move uh, myself and my entire family to to to, to Shanghai. So I've been living in China, Shanghai since then. And uh, oh, okay. And then if you look if you look down LinkedIn, you see that I work with. I work with several companies. I work with uh, one of the earliest companies that I work with is a is a mobile advertising company. Uh, so I spent. The, the next 14 to 15 years, right, in uh, advertising, and they're all digital digital marketing. So to be more specific, it's either you call them MarTech, marketing technology, or ad tech, advertising technology. So okay. I spent the next 15 years doing nothing but but digital marketing. So I work for, uh, I work for Nokia, 
This was back in 2007 where Nokia was like the king of smart, you know, the king of a mobile phone then, right? I remember Finland also, had, yeah. had its moment in the sun. Yeah, I mean, they, this was like, when I was at Nokia, it was like they were the apple of, 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 of this, of, of today, right? So uh, they had 40% market share in China. I think of every 10 phones that goes out, right, phones are Nokia phones. So that was how much of uh, uh, you, you make me feel had. a little bit nostalgic, to be honest. That, <laughs> that was a, that was a, you know, you're, you're talking about the time when I, when I when I kind of grew up technologically. You can say, you know, with Bill Gates and, and you know the early versions of Windows and you know the Nokia phone that everyone got so excited about, and this little country was doing amazing things. Yeah, I mean, I I, I, I think we, we live, I think I think Gordon and he, me and you probably I'm slightly older. I think we live in a very uh, we live in a very, I think we live, we, we, we are born in a very privileged time where we actually saw how things evolve. Yeah. Where, yeah. So we saw, we saw what was a, a road tree phone, <laughs> right? Oh, 100%. And then, no, no, I, I, I was born in analog and, uh, you know, but my, 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 my bar mitzvah president was an Apple II plus computer. I actually bought it myself. And so I was, I grew up during the PC revolution, but I, you know, there's a long tail of the analog. So when I first grew up, I, you know, it was black and white television over antenna, you know, this is before <laughs> cable television. And, and yes, there's rotary phones and phone books and, you know, all that. And, you know, pulling out a physical map to figure out where you're going. And it, it was, you know, stick ship cars were still a thing. But you know, right. I guess I was lucky in the 80s to start seeing the PC revolution. And then when I was in law school, you know, you can probably relate to this. I, I saw the very, very beginning of internet. Uh, and then, right. you know, yeah. And now, and now it's just like in Dubai, it's like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I feel like I've stepped, I, I feel like I'm living in the future. Finally, finally, 2024, I feel like the future arrived because, you know, the, the, right. future, the future I had in my mind in the 1980s is sort of here, sort of. You know, and I think right. over the next couple of years right. we're going to see it. But, but keep, right. keep, let, let me ask you: when, when you when you exited your satellite company, were you, were you happy with the exit? Was it on terms you felt good about? I mean, uh, well, of course I'm happy with the exit. I mean, I mean, any exit, I mean, regardless of whatever the size of the exit, any exit is good exit, right? Uh, uh, okay. The the it the, the joy the the joy of doing startup is not so much just the exit. Is the entire is entire how you you started the company and then went through all the way right? Yes. Uh, meeting people, growing the company, all the pain. I mean, there were several times while growing a company, right? You there are several occasion, a uh, several point in time that you would you 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 always have the feeling that you're not going to make it, <laughs> but you just you just have to keep going. Yes. Right. There were several times where you. We we are at the at the at the verge of collapsing and there's no more money and all that stuff. So it happens many times. And and you're bound to now even running that company. We we while I was while I was sharing with you some of the success story, I have I've also launched a lot of products within the company that failed. So there are there are probably more failures than, than success. So so it's okay to to fail many times, but make yeah. sure that many times that you fail, right? So fail if you fail, fail faster, right? So so I've, I've launched several other products. I mean, I, I've done several and, and you know, most of them, they are not successful. So what I've shared was the successful one, but probably there are a lot more unsuccessful stories. And, and, and it's, and, and that's, that's the way life is. I mean, I mean, I, you ain't gonna... I, I agree. I love failure yeah. because you, you learn more, in my opinion, you learn more from your failures than your successes because your failures, I mean, your successes, you can never be quite sure why you succeeded and you're not sure where the walls are. Maybe you could have succeeded more. You never really know. With the failure, you usually know why you failed, usually. And you can learn from right. that. And that sets you up for right. the better success later, just in my opinion. Right. So, right. okay, so sorry to bounce you around. It's just I'm, I'm, I'm interested about this stuff. So you're in, you're in China. You're, you're fluent in the language. You're starting many marketing or ad tech companies. You, you do that for a very long time, 15 years. Um, was this your startups or you're working with companies or you're pursuing different technologies or what, what's your, what's your approach during that big chunk? Uh, of well, being in a new country, a very, a, a very big country, uh, China, uh, I mean, from, from where I came from, Malaysia, 
Mm -hmm. The population of Malaysia is probably just one Shanghai. Yeah. <laughs> so the city of Shanghai is one Malaysia. That's that's the scale of China. Uh, so it so so I so I I decided uh, after after doing uh, after being in China for a while, I decided that the best way to learn China was to go and work for a big company. Mm. Because when you work for a big company, you get access uh, to a lot of resource to learn, yeah. and also being able to see China. Uh, in a way that I would love to, because if you work in a small company, it's very unlike it's very unlikely that you're going to see that kind of scale. And going to Nokia was was that was my first opportunity to to look at scale, like the number of phones that they sell in China, mm -hmm. right? The 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 thirty one provinces and all the market they are in China, amazing, truly truly amazing, and uh very uh they are one of the big com one of the largest uh, uh companies in, in in China even at the time by any standard. So, yes. so that gave me an opportunity to learn China a lot, and 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 that was my beginning of 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 tracking into the Chinese market and understand un, understanding China, mm -hmm. and and it, so so that the same the same reason and the same the same learning that I have got over the years of experience right allows me to then mentor several companies. I actually joined a lot of companies, a lot of uh, uh startup uh, accelerators, China accelerator, which is now called Orbit. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the uh, Spark Labs uh, uh, Korea. Spark Labs started very small when I met them. Now, now they are all over. They are in yep. US. Spark Labs. They even That's have a Spark great. Lab. I think they even have a, uh, a Spark Lab in Saudi Saudi Arabia now. So, so Spark Labs are all over now. And then uh, of late, uh, uh, the German accelerator. So, so I've always been. I want to be able to like to share what I've learned uh, in terms of. Uh, to a lot of these young people who want to come to China, who want to grow that market, and to explain to them like what kind of dynamics, what are the challenges that you will face in China. It looks like a very, it looks, it, it, it is a big market, but it have, at the same time, it's a very difficult market. Much, much more difficult than any market I've seen in the world. I, I, I don't think anyone would mistake China for being easy. Super hard. Yeah. Super, super difficult. Uh, and I can attest to it because I work uh, in companies like uh, like like Nokia and Google. Even even Google had uh, uh, it, it's no easy ride for Google in China. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's not talk about let's not focus about the the fact that Google has gone dark in in in, in China. Uh, that's 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 a sensitive topic, right? But even before going going into into in, in, before going dark, right? They have to compete here here and here and tour, right? With with a lot of our local players, I mean players like uh, like Tencent, yep. Baidu. These, these are not easy players. No easy players. And it's not it's not because uh, uh, there are a lot of saying that you know all these local companies are copying from them. I think there are a lot more companies copying from each other. I think the the, the whole notion of you know why we and Gini the wheel. So everybody is copying from each other, and and the word copying in China is not just copying blindly. Is copying and make it better. Well, uh, they, they call it re-innovating. Re-innovating, right? So it's right. all about re-innovation, and and the Chinese people, uh, the Chinese players, they are very good at it. So when you yes. look at every segment, right, whether that's going to be the electric vehicle era right now, mm -hmm. the EVs, the smart, right, the electrical, uh, the electronic market, any market that entails. Anything that is digital, they're very good at it. And, and anything that is very manufacturing driven, they're very good at it because they know how to scale up very quickly. Now, so if you look at the recent launch of Xiaomi, mm -hmm. Xiaomi just launched a new EV that looks a little, uh, uh, almost like, like a Porsche taken, almost like a Porsche taken, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and the time that the time that Xiaomi took right from design to delivering that first car is like two years, which which is crazy. Uh, say again, which is crazy fast. Yeah, like, crazy. I fast. mean, it's two years. I you know I remember reading some time ago. It's like in the leader of China at the time basically told his cadres, "Look, I want an auto industry in five years," and they had nothing. And five years later, yeah. they have substantial they companies. They, they do it. Yeah, they do it in and and they recently just uh, launched their, their their car right, and they sold 
I think the initial booking that they have sold 800,000 units. It's amazing. One day. Now, I mean, I, I'm going to ask you what might be a tricky question, and then you, you can tell me if you can answer. Does, does in 2024, does China still have the same hustle? And the reason I'm asking is the, the weight of the debt, the aging population, and me, I, I hear that things are a little bit more closed up, especially if you're a foreigner than it used to be. So if you, if you can address it, what, what's the vibe? Uh, well, China certainly are facing a lot of challenges, economic challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, this this could be now. There's always a price to pay for for rapid growth. Yes, all that, all in the last twenty to twenty five years of rapid growth, right? It's a phenomenon, right? But and 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 there's a price to that, right? The the, the rapid growth in property development, right? The rapid growth in technology. Mm -hmm. All that comes with price because the last twenty five years it was just growth and growth and so you so imagine just growing there was no pain, right? And with, with, with most economy nobody can grow twenty years, right? Without going through some kinds of ups and downs, right? I, I think, I think we're up. even talking more than twenty years. I think we're talking about um, Deng Xiaoping. You know, he he did his famous southern tour in the late seventies, and I remember when he came to the U.S. and met with Carter. You know, back in President Carter back in the seventies, and I think right that was the beginning of the opening, and then it, then Deng Xiaoping just ran with it, and that was from I think that was from the nineties forward. So they they've had a good uh, right. The the like, the opening started the opening started in nineteen eighty. Yeah. So so after so after the meeting with uh with 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 I think it was Carter then, uh so so he decided uh at that point that China should open up and. Because China has been in 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 very difficult and also challenging uh, era for the, at least thirty, I think 30, 30, at least thirty years prior mm -hmm. to that, right? So it opens up, and the one of one of the few things that they did was they opened up the economy. At the yes. same time, they started with the one child policy. It was at the same time. Yes. The one child policy. Uh, so they needed to to manage the the population growth, and they also need to grow the economy rapidly, and and. And China was a very a poor country at that point of time. Economically speaking, they were very, very weak, you know, and, and they've got nothing right on the ground. Uh and and there was the 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 the, the first the first tenure from 1980 to 1990, right? There was a lot of growth, but it was too slow. Why do I say the last 20 years? The last 20 years was at the time where China joined WTO. Yes. China joined WTO, I think if I'm not mistaken, in two zero zero one. That sounds right, more or less. Right, so that was that was when everything just go just went through the roof. Everything went through the roof after joining WTO. So it's about twenty years. Okay, uh, for I, twenty I, I years. Saying, and, I, and I didn't want to belabor the point. It's just like you mentioned, you and I maybe similar ages, and I and I I remember I mean, we didn't read this in history books. We saw it happening, you and I. Right. And you know, and we've seen. The growth. I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't aware. I wasn't around when Mao Zedong and Nixon met. You know, that would, that would, for me, that was history. But when Deng came to the U.S. and they had that meeting and the, the Ascension WTO and everything that's happened since then, I've experienced it personally. I've, I've seen right. it. It's just been. I never, you know what? About it? I never knew the Chinese history. I never, never read the Chinese history before going to China. I, I've never, I've never gone to the Chinese classes. I, I don't have any knowledge about China, China in terms of history or whatsoever. All I know, all my 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 view of China was, oh, I I I have got I'm a descendant, I'm a Chinese descendant, my ancestors ancestors are from China, I know where they live. And that's about it, right? So yes. all this information and all this data that I have I've been been plugged into my head now is as a result of being immersed in China for, for the last 20 years. That, and that, the immersion that's amazing. So the immersion has helped me to now I'm a Malaysian, yeah. So I'm not speaking on behalf of China. So there are there are goods and bad of China, right? I work for multinationals. I work for America. I'm mostly for, for American company. So so I have my view of China. Uh, they are good and bad. I mean nobody's perfect, right? Uh, a, a a lot of time when you read media, when you read foreign media or what they like to term Western media, right? It's always one sided because the Western media always have a view, a, a political view of China, mm. and China. Uh, being China, right? Uh, and when you live there, you know the true story, right? 
and 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 when I look at the, the last twenty years, I think what they have done, amazing. I think I, I given a choice, right? If if that was uh, that was communist, I would love to have communist in Malaysia. If that was if that was that that was communist, right? Mm. And and to see how they function, I would have loved to have that system in my country, because I live in a country with with like multi. You know, it's, it's multi-culture, multi-party and all that. Yes. It's a shitty, it's a poorly run country. Shitty as, as shitty as you may. I mean, that's how I see it. But, but when I look at China, I mean, they're not perfect. My God, they're not perfect. But would, but if you look at historically, China has never ever once historically been run by multi-party. They, that's for 5,000 years, they were ruled by one emperor at any one time, right? So at any one time, now it's, it's like one party. So it's, it's better than one emperor, but, but the party now is the emperor. And, and being Chinese, right? Now, if you allow Chinese to then assemble their own party and teams, you will see the disintegration of the Chinese people because that's what happened in the Chinese in Malaysia. Malaysia... Yeah, we are all one China. You know how many Chinese parties are in Malaysia? We're not united, even though we are a, we are a minority. We're not united. We have got like different parties and different clans, right, that work by themselves. And they don't see eye to eye. I'm talking about Chinese people. So so if you allow the Chinese in China, right, to, to start, you know, having the blue against the red and all that, right, completely disintegration. And you see... Every province going independent. You will see the same thing happening in Russia, the Soviet at that time, like take happening in, in China. So the only way to run China, right? I mean, the, the reality is that it, they need. I'm not agreeing or party. disagreeing. I'm listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't go, have to agree. Go, go, go ahead. I'm only sharing. I mean, I'm not. I'm not. I don't expect you to agree, but I'm. I'm merely sharing. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I disagree. I'm just listening. Go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So that, that's my view of, of uh, when I look at China, and mm -hmm. I, I know it's not perfect. I mean, I mean when you look at current China right now, uh, uh, they, they they have lots of problems. So the one-child policy was great to manage population growth. Now what they are seeing is that because they are so used, to, families are so used to having one child. So now even if you allow them to have more child, they they just they are happy with one child because you have conditioned them for like uh, like at least two to three generations. So they are used to it. So, so now a lot of my friends, right? Local mm -hmm. friends, Chinese friends. So now the governments are encouraging we could have like two or three kids here. They, they're still happy with just one kid because they've yeah. been conditioned, right? So so now they are facing a huge problem with, with, with uh, population growth. And yeah, uh, I, I was, let, let, let me pause you just just because I, I feel like we should do three shows, but I, want, I, would, I just want to keep you. <laughs> I asked you, so it's my, it's my fault, but I want, I want to bring you back to your, <laughs> your business. I, I sorry, know, sorry. I, I love this stuff also. So tell me about, before we get to your blockchain and crypto, tell me, tell me about, you're deeply involved in startups and incubators and growing companies. I, your, your LinkedIn is like a multi-page chronology of this kind of stuff, <laughs> and it, which seems kind of more recent, I think. So tell me what your philosophy was with this. It was our plan, what was our philosophy? What, 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 what spurred and maintains your deep engagement with startups and what's your approach? Uh, I mean, I, I love, I love working with young people. Uh, I've, I've gone down the rabbit hole myself. I've tasted, uh, uh, you know, what, what is it, what is it like to be, you know, days that I don't, that, that I struggle, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've gone through all that stage. I mean, I've been to several rabbit hole, right? Yes. Uh, so, so being able to work with startup and being able to share, being able to con that's that's a way for me to contribute, right? Uh, I don't expect, and a lot of this work that we do is uh, that a lot of work that mentors do is all pro bono, right? We don't get paid, yeah. but it's it's a way for us to to give back, right, and to be able to share. Uh, no ex with, with, with no expectation to get anything out of it. I I've been doing that for years already, and I and and I and I feel good, right? I mean, at the end of the day, if if the if the founder likes me and all that, you never know, right? We'll, we'll probably probably sit in as a as a long term investor or long-term mm -hmm. uh, advisor but but i'm happy you know, just doing advising and helping young people and at the same time that is also a way for me to learn because yes. 
gone were the gone were the days garden that uh, we 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 tell people oh, look at me I've got lots of gray hair so so I've lots of experience these days right experience is basically uh, is actually all this all these these are legacy and the more legacy is like have, you're carrying a lot of baggages right so so the so you don't learn from people who has got a lot of great great gray hair these days. You probably tend to learn a lot more from younger people. So working with startup that gives me a lot of inspiration. Uh, and in fact, if you look at Web three, uh, crypto, and so far, I learn a lot more from very young people. And in fact, a lot of my oh, sure. incubated in companies, areas, no, no doubt, young people, they all in, they are all like in their twenties, right? Twenties at uh, maybe thirties. That's that's all. That's all you're gonna get, right? Very few people are like you and me, right? In in crypto, very few, and and the the, the most savvy one in in tech development, they are young people, mid mid twenties, early twenties. Mm -hmm. So working with startups, you know, will provide me a lot of uh, an avenue to learn and also be inspired to do certain things. It's like a fountain of youth for your brain, right? <laughs> Yeah, I like 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 to like I want to pick their brain. So if I want to pick someone someone else's brain, I will go and talk to a young a young kid and ask him, you know, what's your favorite apps on your phone? Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the app that that that, that someone in the twenties and 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 and, and teen teenagers use, right? You see a huge difference, and and that's why people always say, why is that I'm not able to communicate with my kids? Yeah, that's because you're using different apps, right? Your kids are probably on Snapchat, right? And you're using and they are not on WhatsApp, right? So, 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 advising young companies is actually one of the best way to learn very quickly. Interesting. And then the, you, you seem to have formalized or uh, formalized formalized this through several vehicles, whether it's the thing you did in Germany or the Spark Labs or or so forth. Do you work? To, is it one-on-one -on -one mentoring? Is it through a vehicle? Like, how how do you structure it? Because you seem very popular and, and very busy. Uh, no, with with uh, all this accelerator, usually you know the, the accelerator organizer or the or the program manager they will contact you if someone wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and and usually it's like a matching service, right? Where uh, the 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 startup, the companies that they have they have invested, usually they want to contact certain mentor because they see a fit. Okay. And us usually through a matchmaking session, right? We will we will introduce ourselves and and. The startup, you know, founder gets to get to meet us and see whether that's a fit. That's a fit, right? Then we will start advising them. So again, and because it's pro bono, we are we are under no commitment to, to advise anybody. But if you, if there's a there's a there's a fit, and then you like the, the project or you like the company, you can work on it. So again, uh, again, those 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 are pro bono work that I enjoy very much. As long as as there's a fit, and and I I think I can also contribute. I'll, I'll, I'll help them. Uh, but for full time, right? My full time role. Uh, I basically do a lot of work in terms of incubation and also investment. So one, one, for example, one of the company that I'm spending a lot of time now is a company called Nasdaq. So Nasdaq, Nasdaq is a company, Nasdaq. Uh, but the Nasdaq, as in the spelling N A S D E X. So the yeah. Dex is a centralized exchange and not. Nasdaq. Not, not not Nasdaq. Okay. I was like Okay, okay. I, yeah, I, was, wondering right. so re, I, was, Alvin, I was wondering if you were re-innovating Nasdaq. <laughs> <laughs> I am, but in in a in a decentralized way. That's that's pretty that's a pretty I, I, I sense a trademark issue, but I, I think that's very clever. And right. So <laughs> so uh, so the DEX is Nasdaq. so I I had the idea of actually creating a tokenized asset trading platform. Back in 2021. Okay. So so think of a platform that can tokenize anything and everything. And I actually started off uh, back in 2021. My idea was to tokenize equity. So imagine okay. being able to use crypto to buy uh, uh, synthetics, Tesla, synthetic stocks like Apple. So that was the idea. So I actually created NASDAQ for that purpose. So in, in some way, there was a bit of a re <laughs> re-innovation, right? <laughs> Uh, so so, but that was in 2021 where the the laws the laws around it very gray and SEC wasn't going after anybody yet. But yeah. it's very clear from now. Now you have to be very careful uh, because uh, there's one there's one company called Mirror Finance uh, started by the same founder who started Terra Token, 
who got sued from the SEC for creating tokenized uh, or creating synthetic stocks. So, so I kind of pivot, pivoted from that business. So, so after launching the pro the project, launching the token, uh, we're pivoted to now we are regulated. We are a regulated uh, RWA marketplace. So, so, so we are a real asset. Where are you? Where's the regulator? So, uh, so I, so I have got two pieces of license. One from Malaysia offshore, and okay. the other, the other one is from uh, Philippine offshore license. Okay. So, so it allows me to create uh, S SPO STO programs and also listing uh, and listing on a secondary market uh, as in as a, a a security exchange. Got it. So I can run, I can operate that business uh, in a regulated and fully compliant manner. Understand. Okay. So I'm running that. So I'm running that. I'm also running a matter of fact, a sister company that I also created all for the purpose of doing regulated real world asset tokenization at scale. So That's I'm building great. up that business. So I'm investing in that business. I'm also I've also invested a lot of my time, uh. But it's 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 taking, it's because we 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 are really in early stage RWA real world asset tokenization, really early stage. So it will take some time. Yeah. So we 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 will we'll probably have to you know build this platform uh and then run it over the next couple of years because we need to create a marketplace for the investors and also the token issuer. And on the on the investor side, we're not just creating the community, but we also need to create a private pool community, so that so that investors, right, we have investors on the one end and also token issues on the other hand. I, and I, I, fully, I think also the legal environment and the regulators need to catch up a little bit, or they course. need to be educated up a little bit. Of course, I mean it's very early stage for uh, for, for uh, a lot of regulator that does not understand even. Even regulators that gave us licenses, they they are not very familiar with this area. So you probably have to educate them, right? And telling them what what you want to do, and they will tell you what you can do or what you can do. So I think a, a lot of regulators will probably have to catch up in this area. We are really early in the space, and okay. and in in Web three, when you look at a lot of uh, uh crypto projects uh, or Web three project that's that's actually online right now, they are all very early stage, uh, and and very weak use case at this point of time because. Again, uh, the only thing that's probably making money on 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 blockchain right now is probably taxes, right? Yeah. And uh, and scoring scoring you know making money on 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 crypto trading. That's about it. So 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 very few companies actually make money on on, on Web three at this point of time. But again, I think the space is is a blue ocean. Uh, there's a there's a lot of you know smart people trying all kinds of uh, uh at least experimenting, right? Uh, Various form of uh, DeFi, GameFi, Metaverses, or even uh, RWA. Ex uh, I'm not going to talk about memes, uh, but they are, they are definitely experimenting a lot of things within within the Web3 world. So I, I tend to agree with you. I, I, it's funny. I, I just had breakfast with someone, and he was a the point of view. Well, I'm, I'm going to be semi-contrarian, but not completely. He was of the point of view that 99% of these Web3 startups are going to fail and it's because there's not a profitable business model behind them. I kind of understand where he's coming from, but I also understand that we are a bit in the research and development phase of web three. And this is almost like early internet and yeah. just, sure. Pets.com failed and Yahoo. I don't even know where that is or Alta Vista, but now Every company is an internet company, and every company that makes money is one way or another an internet company. And I, I think, I think this idea that they need to have immediate profitability or immediately know their business plan, I, I, I know it's hard to be a VC right now because all these portfolio companies aren't making money and aren't having exits, and VC is really drying up. But I think we may be swinging too hard the other direction because we just need to allow for experimentation and growth and learning. That, that, that's my feeling. Uh, I I can agree more, Gordon. I I think we are really to me Web three. What's happening with Web three? When what ha happened with internet when we started? Same, it went through the high curve, right? And everyone was trying something. Look yeah, at the number the of companies this, this, that went by. Yeah. Right, like that, right? So 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 the hype train is very in the technology. You need that hype because that hype would accelerate. 
uh, the creation of awareness. People mm -hmm. will tend, what's what's NFT? What's the blockchain? What's what's uh, what's e-commerce? Uh, what's AI? So you need sure. that time. Like similarly in AI, nobody's making money at this point of time. I don't think I don't think open AI is pro is making money by collecting twenty bucks, right? Hey man, I, the I, amount well, of money I, I, they're, they're they're making money off me. Yeah, yeah, sure. But but the, the reality is that nobody's making money on AI yet. But there's a lot of hype at this point of time. But but the hype is actually generating a couple of things. One, adoption. Yep. So a lot of people now start using ChatGPT, right? And then there's and, and using generation ge generative AI. And so so it's actually accelerating. Well, at least if you're not using it, at least you you're trying to figure out and learn what the hell is is generative AI, right? Yep. So similarly to blockchain, similar to the web three world, it it pushes people to learn, right? So it pushes people to learn, you know, the the, the different narrative in in crypto. But at some point, at some point, uh, as long as there's still money, you know, being poured into by VC, mm -hmm. the experiment or the, <laughs> as you may as we always call it, the party will carry on as long as there's money on the table, right? And once the money runs out, that's when the party ends. But when the party ends, right, mm -hmm. is those that are still around, the last bull market, the next bull market, right? If they're still around, these are the companies that's going to stay on. And people who's, and those who are creating a good product, right? Sustainable business model, right? And with, you know, an innovative, they are the one that, that's going to be the next Amazon on Web3, right? The, yeah. These are these are going to be the Google on, on, on Web3. So so the way I see it is that you need that acceleration. You know, the hype is a very powerful acceleration. And then the money that's being poured in, I mean, for similarly, every technology that went through that hype, hype curve, the VCs played a big role, right, in, in funding it. But at the end, right, when the party stopped, right, is we want to see, right, What's the leftover? Who are the who are the ones who has got the staying power? And those companies, right? They are the ones who's going to be the next big player in the future. I, I'd agree that, and I think I'd add. I think I'd add two ideas to that. The there's this law of accelerating returns. I think Ray Kurzweil mentioned that, which is the these these cycles, even the hype cycle, they're becoming shorter because think the technology is moving things so much faster. Like the industrial revolution took 150 years to play out and the information revolution was like 30 years. And, you know, the AI revolution, I, you know, I know there's been a lot of research into it in the past, but it's moving so fast. So the, the hype cycle may go like this, but then the, the coming to sustainability, I don't think is years and years anymore. It may just be a year or two, that's number one. And number two is these, when, remember I, I said, I feel like we're finally living the future here in Dubai. And I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way where you are it's these trends seem to be intersecting very strongly with like AI and blockchain and even drone tech or you know, all these things seem to interact in a way where if you start looking at things, not just in a two dimensional like this, but a three dimensional, four dimensional, whatever, it's more like a landscape it, that undulates. Like this, things focus here for a while, then they focus here, then they focus here, but they're all interacting and all kind of rising together. So I, I don't know if the normal cycle of adoption even applies anymore because if it slows down here, it picks up here. And then when you get better here, it lets this catch up. It's, it's, it's cool to watch. You know, it's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fun time to be alive. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm admiring you for being, you know, active and having your fingers in all these pots and sort of maneuvering your way through it. I You, you never, I mean, it's hard to predict what's the outcome. Uh, nobody can predict. Uh, I, I can't predict. I as much as I try try to predict, right? I mean, we could we could plan, but at the end of the day, most of the plan don't work out in the way you plan it, right? Never, uh, never has so, a plan so, worked out. <laughs> so, so have a plan, right? Yeah. And be be able to adapt and change, right? Yes. Uh, so, so, so I think that's the only way. I mean, you, you have to continue, you know, adapting and changing because the world is changing rapidly. And I agree with you on one point, things are, are failing faster. The height curve is shorter and getting shorter. And it will get much shorter. Now, if you look at failing faster, you know, the, the concept of failing faster, in, in, in the past, right, you'll, you'll probably take a long time to realize, oh, shit, I failed. But probably that's like, that takes like one year. Now, you probably know whether you have just failed, right, after just a couple of hours. Like yeah. when you launch like, like an app service, 
right? You launch your app service and you see shit, there are only like five downloads and you're dead already, right? That's true. So, so, it's, it's, so, it's better so, to know quickly. Yeah, so at least you know, and then you can react very quickly. You don't need to wait five, six months, right? And there's so much data out there that you can pick up. Now, so so that's why a lot of very smart people, unlike in the past, right, they will just guess. Now you don't need to guess. Mm. You, you, can, you, can, you can pull in data and start to predict much more better, right? Yes. Whether you know things will work out based on based on assumption, right? In those days, you can't make that assumption because there's no data, right? And then now you have got AI to assist assist you, right? To to even process even faster, so you could get to point A to point B even much quicker. So we are at that point where everything will accelerate so fast. I mean, that's why the the world ahead is going to be very challenging, you know, for for young people. I mean, I'm I'm not saying I'm glad. Is that I, well? I'm almost at the tail end. <laughs> I, 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 tail end of my. I'm not saying that I, I'm not going to work, but certainly the world ahead is going to be a really challenging one. I mean, in 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 our days when we were kids, when there was no computer, right? Having access to encyclopedia, wow, that was that was a big deal, right? And having access to information is king, right? because most people don't have it. Right? Then That's came. Gone. Yeah. 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 So then, can people say, you know, if you are able, if 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 you if you if you have, you know, search, and if I give you a search engine, if I give you all that, you'll become king because you have all the information at your tip of your finger. But then you start to realize everyone has the same access. So again, having a search engine isn't doesn't make you a king, right? So these days, not only that you need to be able to have access to chat with GPT. You need to be able to prom better, so so it, the it, people it, are it, able to prom well. It, it, it's almost a lawyer like skill, because I I feel like I'm in a deposition with ChatGPT and I just need to ask the question the right way, and if I don't do it, the evil genie will twist my words. So I'm getting you know it's like I'm back in law school a little bit in terms of you know getting called on in torts class, you know having to give the exact right answer so I can get the exact right response, and then tailoring the follow questions. It, it's there's actually some language skill now involved with working with AI, which I wouldn't have seen coming. Right, right. It's bizarre. In the, it's, it's all is how you ask a question. So the prompt is very, very important. So the 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 the, the output that you get from ChatGPT really depend on how you prompt ChatGPT. I've I've known that some of my friends are really good in in prompt in make, making great prompt. So so that would differentiate him. From someone else because of just the prompting skill. It's Amazing. not just English, it's the fact that you know how to ask the right question. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Wow, amazing. So you've been very generous with your time. I, I want to end on what, what might be a light note, which is you have over 300,000 300, followers on LinkedIn. Wow. And you're like a business tech guy. So how, how did that happen? No, I'll share, no, I won't. I'll share with you how it started, right? So okay. I told you that before, right? I used no, to, no I used to run, it's just whatever you want to share. <laughs> no, I, I used to run an I, I used to run an agency, uh, a four years agency, a, a company called Omnicom. Mm -hmm. Omnicom, one of the big four four uh, top advertising in the world. And I went to a client, I'm not gonna mention the client, but a big FMCG uh, uh, company. So so I have a team of, uh, uh, my entire team were pitching to the client to say, you know, this was like years back. And I said, you need to put, allocate some budget on social media. You got to, you need a team on social media. You need to, you know, do something on social media because you need to have a strategy because this is a very important channel. Right. You know what the, <laughs> you, know, you know what the CMO came, came up and said, he said, Alvin, mm. how, many, how many followers have you got on your uh on your at that time he was asking me like you know, on, on on your social media oh no way okay so, and yeah, before he asked going. me that question before he asked me that question he right. actually checked me out already right so he said i don't suppose you have a lot of followers right and i was like you know shit. and i said yeah i i said yeah i have some but not you know so you know what he said he said you don't have a lot of followers you're not very savvy yourself and you are asking me to put money into social media so, I mean, that was, he wasn't trying to attack me, but what he was trying to tell me, how do you know the power of social media if you don't even know how to use it yourself? Right. So, so that kind of like, 
wow. And I was like a wake up call. So immediately I I I I was like I, I in, in entire trip back to my 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 office I was like thinking to myself at this shit, you know, really a wake up call. So I told myself I I I commit to myself right at that point. I told myself I'm gonna like start working on my social media. I'm gonna I, I don't have a target. I don't have a target of, at that time. I think my social media my LinkedIn was probably like maybe you know a couple of hundred people, and then my 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 Twitter was like you know maybe shit maybe under thousand right. Mm -hmm. So I told myself I'm gonna do something about it, and then and, and I don't have a target. I say it has to be it has to be a very meaningful number, right? So I started playing around. I started you know, going into you know, content marketing, mm -hmm. you know, posting hashtag, uh, 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 and 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 the entire the entire you know social media things. I learned the entire social media by myself from scratch and figure out how to become a very good influencer, right? Okay. So I I, I played with it for a while. Believe me or not, gone for three months, right? It was shitty. <laughs> for three months, I, I did everything I could, right? And and the 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 increment, the the following numbers just like increased a little. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it was like fuck, you know. I was like looking, why am I why why is that my my retweet was like one? Why there's no no likes on my post? So why does no one went on for like yeah? So it went on for months, right? But then I gradually got better. I started to 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 like you know hashtagging, uh, look at what trending, and I started looking you know, talk, you know chatting with other influencers, you know commenting on some of the uh, uh, leading tech influencers. So so all this work right is it, is very painstaking, it's a lot of time, but because I was so committed, I, I want to demonstrate to, to my client that I could be good at it, right? Mm -hmm. And and eventually after uh, I think at least I worked on it for at least you know eighteen months. Oh, that wow. I saw 18 months. So that 18 months. So at the end of 18 months, I think my Twitter num account was like I was like this was so organic. I didn't I didn't pay money for anything. Right? So I so organic. My my Twitter was like at slightly over 10,000. And then my Twitter, my LinkedIn was like maybe uh, almost at the same rate, maybe yeah, slightly over 10,000. So okay. it was it was big, yeah, because I went from like you know few hundred like tiny i mean these are like negligible numbers mm -hmm. and and be, and and it became a habit now so so i tell you how every day i i do i i have i schedule 12 posts every day 12 12 posts. yeah so if you, so i use a scheduler right i have a big repository of, of stuff already that, that i want to post i have a huge report because i've been doing more than 10 years already right so i have a repository and i do 12 12 posts which I schedule them ahead of time. So I use an app called Buffer and I schedule what is it them. called Buffer? Buffer, B-U-F-F-E-R. Okay, cool. I'll put, okay, I'll put, so, I'll put in so the show notes use... also, just for everyone else. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not promoting it, but 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 it's a very good app that it, I so use for something. scheduling. So I've been using that, that app for a long time. So I schedule it uh, ahead. So when you look at my, my uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, they are posting almost the same thing. Right, but and same time as well every two hours. Now, so those are regular posts that goes out all the time. It's all scheduled. It's not that I'm smart that I've got a lot of time. Yeah. Now and in between, right? If I see anything that is relevant, mm -hmm. I will also tweet it out very quickly. Right. So so you so on the average, you probably end up seeing about twenty five posts. Bro, each. that is a lot. Right. So 25 posts, but but again, these are all you know very short snacks. But mostly most of the things are are things that I think is relevant at that point of time. And I do that, right? So so it was it took me now. I've been doing that for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. So that number went from 20,000 and it accelerated to 300 and 10 or 320,000 now. Organic, purely organic. And my audience size, they are they are all really senior level. Mm -hmm. uh, I look at the audience makeup, right? Usually they are like CEO, founders, you know, and mostly just big companies. So, so the, that's because I've been feeding, feeding that kind of content for the last 10 years. So it has been very fruitful because combined, I have about half a million, like I have a hundred, 130,000 on, on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, and then 300,000 on, 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 on LinkedIn, Twitter and LinkedIn combined. The rest of the stuff I don't I'm not I don't do personal posts. I don't post myself having lunch and all that. I think that's 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 not my cup of tea. It's not for you. So
for a long time. So it's again, uh, again, what made me committed to this is, is because I got, I got a, a, a fantastic way. I, I really have to thank him. I actually thank him years later. I I, I thank you for- He did you a big for, favor. For, 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 for every couple. That, that's super. Alvin, uh, uh, you know what? You've given me twice the time I normally do, but you're, you're amazing. I just, that, we're going to end on that note because that, I, I think that kind of summarizes you, which is you see a challenge, you take the bait, you go with it, you go deep, you learn something new and you execute over time and you're successful and you share your knowledge. I think that kind of encapsulates who you are and your generous open approach and the fact you've been very successful with it. You're personally successful and you're, you're the ultimate success because you, you create success in other people as well. So, you know, thank God you, bless thank you. you. And I, I, I have this one, one tagline that I always, you know, would want to share. Now, regardless of your age and regardless of, of whatever that you do, right? Now, if you could just, now the way to stay ahead of the game or to stay way ahead is to learn. Yes. Always learn, unlearn, relearn. Ooh. Learn, unlearn, relearn. You must now. You must be capable of learning, right? So you. So so this is always learning is constant. So you always have to learn, mm -hmm. and and but, but because technology is moving so quickly, everything is moving so quickly. So there will come a point where you have to unlearn those knowledge, because those knowledge are like obsolete. So you need to unlearn them very quickly. Not easy. It's always very difficult to unlearn what you have learned. Yes. And thirdly, right, you have to relearn the new things. Unlearn and relearn. If you can, if 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 we can do all that at the same time, right? Anyone can do that at the same time, right? They will always be ahead of the game. They will always be relevant. Learn, Hello. unlearn, relearn. Learn, unlearn, relearn. Perfect. All right. I'll, we're going to end on that note. I, I, I want to thank you for your time and your spirit and your engagement and availability and everything else. So thank you very much. I hope you had a good time. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me on your show, Gordon. All the best to you. Stay in touch. Oh, bye-bye.